I am frequently asked how to change the neckline of a sweater pattern so that it has a v-neck. This week's Technique Tuesday video will take the mystery out of how v-necks are planned and calculated. In a previous Technique Tuesday video, I explained the basics of how shaped necklines are planned using the example of a crew neck. I'll link to that video up at the top as well as down in the video description. Like other shaped necklines, a v-neck can be knit into sweaters with seamed shoulders, like those with drop shoulder, modified drop shoulder, or a sweater with set-in sleeves. They can also be incorporated into raglan sweaters. Circular yoke sweaters do not have shaped necks, so a v-neck would not be used in that type of sweater. So this is a schematic of a sweater that has a v-neck shaping. Like all schematics, the outline shape right here of the neck opening represents the size of the neck opening, the unfinished size. So before you pick up stitches and work the ribbing. So my little quarter scale model right here uh, has worked that opening and I don't have stitches picked up. I don't have any ribbing worked yet. So that's that opening size right there. A typical opening for the back of the neck would be about half of the distance of your shoulder width. So sweater shoulders, uh, where those seam lines are, can vary. For a drop shoulder, it can hang over quite far, and for modified, a little bit, and then for set and sleeve, you're gonna have those shoulders lined up right with the actual body. Uh, so that neck opening is going to be the same regardless of your sweater style. Also typical would be about one inch of ribbing uh, going around to fill in that opening a little bit. In this particular example, the depth of the unfinished opening is the same as the, the width of the back of the neck. That's going to give you something deeper than a crew neck, but not something super deep. It's going to be moderately shallow v-neck. Some v-necks are going to be deeper, they're going to be close to whatever the, uh, the underarm shaping is, and then some are going to be deeper still and be uh, and start the shaping is going to start down here. So it really depends on the type of sweater and the look that you are going for, how deep that neckline is. The shaping that you do on either side is going to match the number of stitches wide that you have at the back of the neck. So, and it's gonna be divided evenly on each side. So you're gonna work the, the shaping evenly. You're gonna be working decreases if you're working bottom up. You're gonna be working increases if you're working top down. This half inch to an inch at, at right closest to the shoulder is going to be just vertical. You're not gonna be doing any shaping here. So you're gonna to wanna to have your shaping done when you have about a half an inch to an inch left to go up to the shoulder. And if you have shoulder shaping, you're going to have to be doing it at the same time that you're finishing up your neckline shaping as well. One of the things that you need to watch out for with a V-neck is that the finished opening isn't too wide. There are a lot of necklines in contemporary sweaters, the scoop or rounded crew neck type of, of necklines that are really quite wide. And the problem with making a V-neck with a finished opening that's that wide, you have a very large opening here. When you add the weight of sweaters pulling on the shoulders, that can just open up and the sweater will wanna slide off of your shoulders. So with a V-neck, you tend to wanna to be a little bit uh, narrower um, than you might wanna be in a contemporary uh, scoop neck, which can be a bit wider. So one of the things I do when I'm trying to figure out how deep of a v-neck I want is to try on something that has a v-neck and then use that as a starting point. So maybe I would put this uh, t-shirt on and think, oh, you know, I, I don't want it to end here. I want it to end um, just a little bit higher than that. So I could look and say, okay, I want it about a, a half an inch higher. The, the finished depth, I want about a half an inch higher than this. Or maybe I want it a little bit lower. And so I could uh, make that comparison. So when I'm trying to decide what I want in my V-neck, I'm looking at what I want the finished size to be. So figuring out where I want that to hit to hit on my body. And then I need to, to think about how wide I want the ribbing to be. 
and therefore how much wider I need this opening to be in its unfinished state so that when I pick up the stitches, I can work the ribbing to the depth that I want. Let's do some example calculations for a couple of different uh, v-necks so you can see how you would plan the shaping. Let's start with this one that is six inches wide and six inches deep and we're going to plan it for worsted weight yarn. So that's typically five stitches per inch and seven rows per inch and we want something that is six inches wide and something that is six inches deep. So the back of this neck is 30 stitches wide. That means if we're working bottom up, when we get to the neck, we're going to have to eliminate 15 stitches on this side and eliminate 15 stitches on that side. If we're working top down, we're going to um, start with our shoulder stitches and we're going to uh, increase 15 stitches on this side and increase 15 stitches on this side and once we have all of the stitches then we can work them all back and forth. The depth of this is also six inches and if we have seven rows per inch that means we have to do this over the course of 42 rows. Now remember we want to keep that that final inch half inch to inch at least um, straight at the very top so we want to be done with our shaping um, before we get to the very top. So we, if, if we are working at seven rows per inch, then we need at least half an inch, so at least four rows at the very end, somewhere between four and seven or eight rows at the very end. Because we have 30 stitches, that means we have 15 increase or decreases on each side. We want to work our decreases on right side rows so that we can see what we're doing. So we need at least one plain row between each decrease row. So we're just gonna start out with all of our decreases laid out with one plain round after each of them and four plain rounds after that final one for our straight part. So if we add all of these up, we've got uh, 14 decreases and 14 plain rounds, that's 28. Then we've got 29 and we've got four here. That's 33 rows so far. We need to add nine because we need a six inch depth. So that has to be 42 rows. So we need to add nine additional rows in here. When we add the plain rows in between decrease rows, we're going to do it in pairs. So that will keep our decrease rows on right side rows. So this plain row right here is a wrong side row and we wanna add a right side and wrong side row um, plain. So we can add that here at the end. So that's two, four, six, eight and we still have one oddball one so we can add one more down there and that will give us all of our decrease so we can look at this little map and we can know that every time we do a decrease we're going to do one plain round and then when we get to the 11th one we're going to work three plain rounds after that row uh, decrease row and then we're going to do our 12th one and then three etc until we get to the very end So let's do another example. Let's say instead of six inches wide and six inches deep, we've got something that's a little bit wider, six and a half inches wide. And then we wanna have something that's quite deep that we want it to be nine inches deep. So this is going to be a steeper, longer neckline right here. So how would we figure that out? Uh, well, it's going to be six and a half inches wide times five stitches per inch is 32 and a half stitches. And we have to have an, a, a solid number. We need an even number. So 32 stitches is how wide that's going to be. So 16 inch or uh, 16 decreases each side and nine inches deep is going to be 63 rows. Well, when you look at 16 decreases and 63 rows, you can sort of guesstimate that you can do one decrease every four rows. 
So if we look at that, if we do a decrease and then we do three plain rounds and then a decrease three plain rounds. So that's doing a decrease every four rows. They'll be on right side rows. Um, and we know that we want at least uh, four at the bottom, at the, at the very end, to give us a half an inch. Well, if we add all of these up, we've got 60 uh, rows right here just from the first 15 decreases and the three plain rounds. That's 60 rows right there. And then we've got 61. And then we've got four plain rounds. That's 65. And we need 63. We need to get rid of two. Well, we don't really want to get rid of the two at the top because we really do want at least half an inch. So when you're deciding where to add plain rows and when to where to take out plain rows, you're going to want to add them starting at the shoulder. And that's so that you're spacing those decreases further apart as you get closer to the shoulder. As you are closer to the base of the neck, you are going, that's where you're going to want to have them more frequently. So if they can't be all exactly the same, you want them more frequent near the base of the neck and further apart at the shoulder. So we can take two stitches away from here, or two rows away from here so that we only have one plain round. So after the first decrease round, we're going to work one wrong side row, and then we're going to work another decrease row on a right side, and then we'll have three plain rounds. And then we can continue that all the way up, and we'll still have our four plain rounds at the end. So we've taken away two, and now we have our 63 rows. One of the differences that you will see between a V-neck and a, a neck style that's more rounded is that with the rounded necklines, the number of stitches that you pick up for the ribbing is going to be maintained for the entire depth of the neckline, typically. If you're going to be knitting something that's an inch to an inch and a half deep, that would be the case. With a V-neck, there is a little bit of a difference. Because you have this kind of sharp corner going right here, you are going to be decreasing at the base of this neckline every other round. You're going to eliminate two stitches every other round at the base of the neck. And it can look a couple of different ways depending on the type of ribbing that you're wanting to use and the type of look you're trying to achieve. So this is an example of what the base of a V-neck would look like if you were using Knit One Pearl One ribbing. So you'd have this column of knit stitches coming up the center. Uh, and you, when you worked decreases, you'd use what's called a central double decrease. So it, you're working three stitches together um, and the middle stitch ends up on top every time. So you're eliminating stitches uh, and the, those stitches that are being eliminated seem to disappear underneath this center column. If you're doing something like knit two, purl two ribbing, instead one way that you can approach that is to have two stitches at the base of the neckline that are both knit stitches. And again, you're going to decrease two stitches every other round. But in this case, you're going to use mirrored single decreases. So right here, you're going to use a knit two together, which is a right leaning decrease, and it will keep this first knit stitch on top of whatever it is being decreased with. And in this column right here, you're going to work a left leaning decrease. You could use an SSK decrease, or you could use SKP, which is also known as slip one, knit one, pass the slip stitch over. They both produce the same result, but they're different techniques. So that will put this stitch on top of the one um, that's next to it. So you're going to be eliminating like purl stitches gradually and then you're going to be eliminating knit stitches gradually. So it, over time you're going to lose pattern, stitch pattern continuity at the base but that's okay because those stitches that you're losing seem to be going underneath this spine right here and that stitch continu continuity disruption is not going to be an issue. Here's a really old sweater that I never wear. It has a V-neck and it has that Knit One Pro One ribbing with that little rib going up the center there. This is a, a linen top that I have that has a, a kind of a narrow ribbed band going around the neck. 
And in this case, it has knit to purl to ribbing, but at the base of the V, it's a single column of knits. And so the technique that was used here was the central double decrease, keeping that central knit stitch on top, but the rest of the stitch pattern was knit to purl to. And I only worked a few rounds of this because it was a very narrow band. When I did the bind off, you can see that I have these two knits over here. I've eliminated those two purls in my decreases. I have that central knit. And again, I eliminated those purl stitches there in my decreases. And I have two knits here. So I had five knit stitches in a row in the bind off round. This is an example of a vest, so it doesn't have sleeves, that ha does have a very wide opening. The initial opening, the unfinished opening was very wide and there's pretty deep ribbing, but the finished opening is still very wide. And this works okay because there are no sleeves that are dragging this open and off my shoulders. And in this case, this is a very deep V that went uh, started well be uh, before the underarm decreases. And in this case, there wasn't a mitered decrease line going up the center. Instead, there was a span of stitches that were kept live, put on waist yarn. Um, and then the decreases, uh, the shaping was worked. And when the ribbing was picked up, it was picked up just along those diagonal edges. And then the ribbing was worked for an inch and a half or two, however uh, long that is. And then the selvages, the edge stitches of that ribbing were then attached to these live stitches here. And then this edge here was sewn to the back. So that gives this kind of crossover effect. So there are a lot of different ways that you can do a V-neck. And of course, you could do them in cardigans as well. In this case, you're not picking up only for a neckline, you're picking up for the front bands at the same time. So you start at the bottom of the right band, go up the neck around and then down the side of the left and you knit the entire band at one time. If you'd like to learn more about the basic concepts behind how sweaters are designed and constructed, this series on basic sweater styles may be of interest to you. You might also be interested in this video over here. If you have any questions about sweater design elements and how to change them, you can leave a comment down below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.